the hospitality industry. Coming up live shortly. Hi, welcome to Convex Up channel. I'm Bonnie Rajazan, your host for Expert Insight at Live, a broadcast series featuring forums and interviews with industry thought leaders on market, policy, strategy, technology, and innovation that steer the industry growth. To all our viewers, if you have any inquiries or questions, kindly share them on Slido at hashtag hospitality expert inside at live. You can also pose your questions through the Q&A message box below the live broadcast channel. One of the industries that experienced the extreme bad weather of COVID-19 is the hospitality industry with tens of thousands of employees being sent home for good. More than 50% of the hotels considering cease operations, and some decided to remain closed till next year. Close to 50% of the hotels and leisure destinations globally have to shut down their operations and businesses are going on sale. With the help from governments, the hospitality industry, like other sectors, will recover. So, how would the new normal be? How can the industry make consumers feel safe again? How can the industry re-image themselves to spear growth? Would it hit on another worse crisis? I have with me today some of the most remarkable experts in the industry. First, we have Professor Dr. Walton Jameson, FCIP, RPP, a John Professor, Hospitality and Tourism Management of Ryerson University. Next, we have Dr. Brett Van Walbeck, Managing Director of the Winning Edge Bangkok. And also, Professor <coughs> Jeff Harry Hobson, Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement of Sunway University of Malaysia to share their insights and thoughts on how can the hospitality industry be back in action, regain the confidence of the customer, and be ready for the next crisis. The discussion today will be moderated by none other than Mr. Michael I. Waits, founder of Metallic Partners, Blockchain Labs.ai, and Michael Waits Media. Without further ado, I will now hand over the segment to Michael. How are you, Michael? I am super. How is everybody doing today? Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Okay, let's get this going. We're going to start with some presentations to kick this off. I believe we agreed that we were going to start with Perry. Perry, do you want to jump in and do this? Sure. Well, good morning and uh, uh, good day to everybody. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm, it, it's, a, it's a conversation about the future that I think uh, everybody needs to be having. Uh, too often we don't have so much of a conversation uh, about the future and looking at what we anticipate the future to be. Obviously, as you've heard from the introduction, we're un, in unusual times, but that shouldn't prevent us from looking ahead and looking at what might be uh, coming down the line and to think about that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. So look, I'm, I'm looking for this forward to this morning's discussion and uh, to share some thoughts with you uh, about the future. So look, uh, first of all, my name is uh, Professor Perry Hobson. I'm based uh, here at Sunway University in Kuala Lumpur uh, in KL and uh, in Malaysia. And so what I'd like to be able to do is sort of 
give a little bit of introduction for that for people who may not know much about Malaysia if you're tuning in from outside the region. Uh, Sunway University is based in Sunway City, which is really a sort of suburb of KL. Uh, it's an integrated suburb with uh, not only the university, but also shopping mall, theme park, hotels, uh, et cetera. So it, it's, it's an unusual uh, spot to be in. Now, I've been living in Malaysia myself for the last uh, eight years. Uh, previous to that, my background was growing up in the UK, uh, where I did my undergraduate degree, my master's in the US, and my PhD in Australia. And I've been involved with both professional uh, academic organizations and industry organizations in, in many uh, countries uh, over, the, over the years. So thanks very much for the invitation this morning and to share some sort of thoughts with you because my uh, focus uh, has often been about looking at the future. And um, just to give you a couple of quick insights, uh, um, I've been teaching a course in uh, Innsbruck at uh, an organization, an organization called MCI, Management Center Innsbruck, for probably about 14, 15 years now. And uh, I work there with students each year to do a project on visioning the future. Uh, and this year it was unusual because normally I fly there and obviously I couldn't this year. So we were looking at 2050 and, and what the future will be like. And then I also speak at a number of different conferences uh, in Malaysia and around the region. Uh, last year, for example, I was invited over to uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam to look at smart tourism. And uh, so today I wish to pick up on two themes uh, in my presentation, which when we're looking at 2030. And those two themes are built around technology and the issue of sustainability. Okay. Um, when we start thinking about 2030, I like to ask people, what is your vision? What's your plan? Um, or are you in an organization that's just going to wait and see what happens? Um, I'm afraid to say that many organizations don't have much of a plan. They don't think about visioning the future. Uh, they're trying to deal on quarterly reports. Uh, they're worried about last month's occupancy rate. They're really not thinking about issues relating to uh, how their business is going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20, or as I get students to think about what it's going to be like in 30 years. But for today, we're just looking 10 years out. And I, as I ask people to look forward, I often like people to think about looking back. Please just remember, it was only 10 years ago that the iPad was invented, 10 years. Mm -hmm. So before that, we didn't swipe, we didn't have all those, the, the, those things happening. So that change, uh, I now watch pilots on airplanes with iPads, the paperwork's all gone, we've got touch screen in pretty much everything we do. We're now gonna move beyond touch screen because of the health issues. So when we think about 2030, think about how different that's going, going to be. So, one of my concerns for the industry is that so often we have operations which are really kind of stuck a little bit in the past. Uh, we look back to the golden age of travel a hundred years ago, uh, and I'm afraid to say that too often, uh, as from an operational point of view, we've really not been on the front foot of where we see our operations uh, being. And so my concern is when I talk to a lot of people in the industry is how can we see things looking ahead to the future? So when we look about that, I say, what is your idea of the future? And what are those ideas going to be? And uh, we can see from what the pandemic has just brought that often we get a lot of disruption. And so the future uh, business is going to be one where there will be additional disruptions. Whilst the pandemic is a huge, what we refer to as black swan event, it will not be the only one. And we have to think about how the future is going to be. And as one of the quotes I like to, to use is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. In other words, you've got to think about what the future will be like and then how can you create something uh, from, that, from that point. Now, when we start looking at 2030, there could be different ways that your organization and that a futurist will be looking at the future. And there's three different ways of looking ahead. The first of those is what is, and it's commonly referred to as forecasting. And basically we take figures we know and we just add, well, for example, 
occupancy went up 5% last year or growth. Uh, this year we'll do 5% more and next year we'll do 5% more. Well, unfortunately, that kind of forecasting has got huge problems with it, particularly when you hit something like a pandemic, because suddenly all those forecasting models go out the window. So these are the challenges. And obviously, future forecasting in that way, you can put in various things to an, uh, an algorithm, but it's a fairly often in the simplest way done is, is fairly linear. Scenarios is where you look at a future scenario. What is the world going to be like? And we look forward to say a year and we say, well, this is what a day in the life of a general manager in a hotel in 2030 will be. So how will that be different to where we are today? Backcasting is where we look at the future and we give a desired future. We create a desired future, a target of the future. And we say, how do I work to that? So for example, um, if you want to think of that as an, on a personal level, think about your retirement plans. If you want to retire at 65, how much money do you need to have at 65? And then we work back from there to say, how much money do you need to have saved when you're 55, 50? So what have you got to do now to hit those goals? So when we look at that in terms of the industry, let's look at uh, scenarios, for example. Even for big companies like airplane manufacturers, which one would you have picked? Would you have picked the faster future, which is the Concorde? Their view was people will get from main business cities uh, very quickly. It would only take a small number of passengers. It would be fast but exclusive. That was there when they created Concorde future scenario. Airbus saw a future with moving large numbers of planes, a future built off the old 747, but even bigger. It would use central hubs. It would be efficient. We could have grand designs on the airplanes, showers, bars, etc but it was gonna be, as it's turned out now, quite costly. Or do you fly point to point? And we can see that the Boeing 787 and A350 are the ones that are now capturing the market. Concorde is gone. Airbus A380 has been discontinued. So that scenario, a different scenario future has worked its way out. So when you think about the future, that scenario. When we come to backcasting, we pick a point in the future and we have a vision. So Toyota, for example, has said by 2040, it will stop production of petrol engines. Okay, so that's 20 years time. So what have they got to have done by 2035, 2030, 2025, and tomorrow to get to that future point? So companies like this one, Natural Step, they work with all sorts of hospitality companies, such as Starbucks, Mervyn Pick, Carlsberg, et cetera to work out what their future vision is and what have they got to do to get there. Now, brings us to a question, what's your vision for 2030? So is our vision for 2030 to be a Groundhog Day version, if you remember the movie, where Bill Murray wakes up every day and relives the same day? So are we going to have that same day version by 2030 as we had in 2019? Or do we have a vision for an industry that will be different? Because I hate to tell you this, but 2019 wasn't that great. Most of our discussions were about over-tourism, about whether tourism was sustainable. We had various destinations such as the, uh, the beach near Krabi in Thailand being closed or Boracay. We were an industry that had some problems. So do we wanna go back to those or do we wish to vision something that's going to be different, better? So this brings me on to my first point, which is going to be about technology. So if technology has changed rapidly in the past, look at that adoption curve. It took a couple of hundred years to get from the printing press to the telescope. So the speed that we are going to see technology is going to be quite dramatic going forward. Now, this brings us on to what is often referred to as tourism 4.0, built off the idea of industry 4.0. So the idea here will be that tourists will create experiences and we are going to be creating those in, in, a, in unique and different ways because of the connectivity we've got through technology. Now, obviously, this has huge implications for hotels because how the world is connected and interconnected will change. Already, tourism destinations are working on that. And that's why I was presenting last year in Ho Chi Minh City about this issue of smart tourism. 
So various cities, uh, for example, this is Prague in the Czech Republic, they've already got their tourism, smart tourism plan for 2030 to work out how they can connect everything in the city. Now, this is part of a bigger project of smart cities where everything from water to electricity to traffic lights is going to be connected and interconnected. And now we can overlay tourism into that. So we can identify tourist flows, which restaurants are busy, uh, where, where, where crowds are, where they're not. We can create personalized itineraries during a daytime to avoid all those congestion areas around a city. And that's just one example. So think about what that's going to mean when you're starting to walk around. So for example, everything you can see in this picture will be able to be connected and interconnected. Where's the taxi going? Which bus? How many people are on the bus? Can I buy a ticket on the bus? All of these will be connected and interconnected for tourists. So let's come to hotels. So if we want to have smart hotels, let's look at some smart people. Let's imagine if these guys ran a hotel. So if Elon Musk, maybe he's going to come up with the Tesla hotel. Well, for a start, he'd make sure you arrive in an electric car. You wouldn't have any problem with power running out. The hotel would be carbon neutral. And of course, the service would be really fast. Smart, fast. James Dyson, well, he would redesign every electric item used in the hotel. We'd have Dyson kitchens and restaurants, maybe even the Dyson toilet. Though, given what he's done with fans, that could be a little bit interesting. Jack Ma, wait, Alibaba has already started a hotel. So let's have a look at their one to give us a glimpse into the future because they've already opened this property. So when we start looking at 2030, we have to look around us now to see what has already been started, to see where the future may be taking us. And it's this combination of high tech and what we used to say as high touch. But of course, touching things is a little bit off, off the moment. So it's gonna be maybe high swipe is what we're going to be looking at going into the future. So we can begin to see how the marrying, as I mentioned, I found hotels quite technology adverse. We were people businesses. People gave service to people. But now we have to rethink how that is being done in terms of how we can use technology. I don't think that's gonna be the world's worst problem for hotels, because my feeling is that we have given a lot of our staff in hotels fairly robotic jobs. They ask the same questions when you check in. Do you have a reservation? Can I have your passport? Have you got a credit card? We can get a machine to do that, dare I say, much more efficiently. And this can actually release our staff to do the job we want them to do, which is actually to be hospitable, rather than just be a human version of a robot. So I think we're going to see some changes come through with that. Let's get more radical. If you're interested, you can go to the Radical Innovation website, look at new hotels designs, because the focus of this is not going to be just on the technology, but it's also on making hotels sustainable for the future. And that's going to take us into sustainability. So in terms of sustainability, what's our vision? Now, the UN Sustainability Development Goals uh, have got a focus date of, guess what, 2030. And the 17 goals here are designed, whether it's to look at um, uh, climate action, uh, looking at uh, reducing inequality, clean water, responsible consumption and production. All of these are not abstract goals. They tie in to our industry at all sorts of different levels. So at Sunway University, we have got the Jeffrey Sachs Center the, the UN Development Goals were developed by him. Uh, his main position is based at Columbia University in the US. And we were very pleased to develop the Jeffrey Sachs Center here. We've got a master's in sustainable uh, uh, management. And the focus for us has been very much, and the focus for Sunway has been, how do we start to build in and focus on the sustainability? Remembering we've got a hotel chain, 13 different hotels ourselves. So we have to vision a more sustainable hospitality industry. If we don't vision it, legislators will bring it on us because the sustainability issues the planet is facing, which I know are on the back burner at the moment because of the COVID pandemic, will come back in full force very, very shortly. And the issues we've got about water use, land use, energy use, pollution, none of that's gonna go away. In fact, if anything, the pandemic has taught me 
that there is blue skies in KL. It just doesn't always have to be pollution. <laughs> so these are issues we can and we need to think about. Already some chains, and I'm just using Hilton as an example here, but other ones such as Radisson, et cetera, are already working on these sorts of things. But we have to have a clear vision of what we want the sustainability to be as we go forward. So let me leave you with some fairly steering images at the end of time when it comes to the hospitality industry. No one would have predicted that the planes wouldn't be flying, our hotels would be empty, that we would be in this situation of a pandemic that we've now got in 2020. My warning to everybody is always that if this industry is not going to work out how to be responsible with its future use in terms of adoption technology and working out how to use itself environmentally, we will end up on the scrap heap of history. So we need to think about how we are going to work, particularly with these two concepts going forward. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of food for thought to kick off this morning. Thank you very much. Harry, thank you so much really for doing that. I, I think everybody else who's listening to this and watching this probably has ended up with a full page of questions just like I have. But to keep the conversation going, I think Walter is meant to um, follow you, is that correct? Or, or is it uh, Walter meant to follow, yes? Great, well, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm based now in Canada, so it's late into the evening. Thanks to the uh, organizers for allowing me to participate in this session. Next. Um, just a brief uh, discussion of who I am. Born in Montreal, uh, studied in Toronto, then went to the UK and did um, uh, some degrees, trying to put off working as long as I could. Um, then went to Calgary and work in a, worked in a faculty of environmental design. Then had the good luck of moving to Bangkok and working at the Institute of Asian Institute of Technology, then moved to Hawaii and back to Thailand and now in Canada. Um, next. And during that time, I've been uh, very fortunate to do uh, regional plans, ASEAN, working in places like Chengdu in Indonesia, uh, many places in China. Um, and I've really had the, the challenge of working with the stakeholders. And I view the industry, of course, as the private sector, but, all, but government being an important part of the industry. And uh, so my remarks, brief remarks this morning, will be looking at how we deal with some of the issues that um, Perry was talking about next. One of the challenges that we have as planners and, and people trying to look into the future is that there almost has been a sense that we have a crystal ball and Perry did a good job about looking into the future so I won't spend uh, any time on it except to say that for those that believe in that crystal ball, it's quite muddy right now um, and we're ever more challenged as we move forward. Next. I'm not gonna go through each of these challenges, but uh, Perry raised some of these, um, but there are a wide range of, of questions that we have to ask of looking at where do we see the industry being in 10 years from now? What kind of hard decisions are we gonna make? Um, for 10 years, I ran an innovation program uh, at Thomas Hutt University, and we worked with a lot of private sector and governmental groups and found that there was very little interest in innovation, almost to the point of not wanting change. And so I'm quite realistic about the challenge that's facing us and hopefully the pandemic may help people to say we need to do things differently that because we did it this way yesterday, that's the way we're gonna do it. I'd like to mention just two quick challenges. Are we gonna go for quantity, which as Perry was saying, has driven the industry for too long and has caused significant problems environmentally and socially, culturally, economically, or are we going to start looking at quality as the uh, kind of tourism that we want to develop? And now, and too many people are looking at quality as that high-end tourist. And everywhere I've worked, everyone wants that high-end tourist. There's a limited number of those if we look at it in an economic sense, but we can produce high-quality experiences 
that will bring us the right kind of financial returns. And then the other thing that we have to look about as at the role of government and what the role of government's gonna be as we move forward. Next. So as Perry was referring to, and I think we all feel, we're incredibly uncertain about not only today and tomorrow, but what will really be possible in the future. Uh, given the kind of, of constraints that there are, what I like to view as the antibodies that work against us achieving better states. And so I, I start off with, with saying, we've got to overcome the sense that because of uncertainty, we don't do anything. Next. And so the, the new term right now is always the new normal. And um, some of us have been talking about a better normal, not just a new one, but a better one that really aligns with what Perry ended his presentation with in terms of the sustainable development goals. Can we do better? And one of the things that we understand then is that we need to develop new mindsets that we have to put behind the, the past in some respects. But think about now what kind of tourism do we want to deliver that would best meet the needs of the local population, that will provide a quality experience to tourists, um, and that will help the disadvantaged to be in a much better place than they are before tourism. Next. One of the, the challenges that we all face is that we really are not, in many cases, trained nor oriented to dealing with complexity. That often, and I've seen this throughout the beginnings of this pandemic, that people are looking at the small pieces of a much more complex series of systems that we need to be addressing if we're gonna be successful in the future. Successfully now, as Perry identified it, through the SDGs. And so part of the uh, difference in thinking, the mindset change is can we train ourselves, can we train others to begin to see the interconnection between public and private, uh, between communities and tourists, between large scale and small scale enterprises. And that's an incredibly difficult thing, but if we don't uh, achieve a systems thinking, dealing with complexity, um, we won't achieve, I would argue, the kind of vision we would want for 2030. Next slide. And not surprisingly then, um, we need collaboration. We need to be much more effective in working with each other. And this public, uh, this public sector, private sector, nonprofit divisions, I feel are quite negative and work against achieving the kind of futures we want. And we still have, are talking about this a year later, even though we understand that working in silos is not going to achieve the kind of results we want, largely, and I'll say here within the public sector, much of what occurs in around tourism development is in a series of silos, often with people not talking to one another. So there needs to be this sense that collaboration, working together is going to be necessary and it and as perry said even to defining what the visitor experience looks like next so partnerships have traditionally been seen as public private how do we build uh, a rapid transit system or a dam or something else but this idea that public private nonprofit have um, should have common interest in working together and we we'll need to develop partnership models and structures that really allow us to deal with the complexity that um, exists within the tourism system. Um, Perry talked about innovation, uh, innovation in technology, innovation in the way that we define our markets, the way that we begin to determine how we can best meet their needs. What kind of experiences are there gonna be in 2030? Um, is going to be significant disruption, as Perry talked about, in terms of what it will be like to visit a destination in 2030. Um, we really need to think about the way that we're going to govern ourselves and look at innovative responses to uh, the kind of situations that we're facing. Next slide. 
one of the uh, and I'm, one of the challenges that we have is that almost the first impulse now is we're going to start planning, doing master plans, five year plans, ten year plans. I would say that right now we really need to think carefully about whether we need strategic plans. They never worked really well in many cases when things were um, with the old normal, but I would clearly say that we need to think strategically, that we're not working to produce plans, we're producing, we're working in a strategic way to come up with strategies that will work in the future, taking into account the com complex system in which we work. Next slide. And, and one of the things, and, and I'll just speak about this very briefly, um, is we need to be tactical in what we're doing, that too often we don't feel we can move forward unless we have a grand plan. And one of the things that we've learned certainly within urban planning and regional planning is that doing a bunch of things quickly to test the market, to test whether these strategies work, at the same time being able to demonstrate to the industry that things are changing, that there's movement ahead is really important. So I would always hesitate to wait for that great strategic plan um, um, until you can actually do something. Next slide. And that leads me to two final thoughts. The first is that the way that we've governed tourism um, is, is, has not worked in the past, certainly won't work to the future if you're thinking in the future's way that Perry was describing and that I've been talking about, that it's no longer sufficient that we have, and I've just used one example here, a destination management a marketing organization that does this, and there's another government department that does um, development and somebody else does something else. That the, the new thinking certainly um, that came from Europe, this is new in a sense of a different way of looking at things, is thinking of really combining the various stakeholders and interest groups together to work together. And um, we see models coming out and a good example of an integrated model is London and Partners, where a series of private and public sector interests have come together to position London, not only from a tourism point of view, but as a place to work and as a place to invest. I don't have what that answer is, but the, clearly by 2030, we will have to have very different models. We're already seeing in Europe the idea of not the DMO, but the DDMMO, the Destination Development Marketing and Management Organization, where the various functions of a complex system are brought together. Next slide. And in order to do that, we're gonna to need to develop a new set of skills and knowledge that within our tourism schools, within um, tourism organizations, we're often missing the very skills gonna be necessary to work in an interdisciplinary way. How do we get people from various disciplines to work together? What are all the soft management skills that uh, Perry was discussing and others have talked about? And then what are the, the technical competencies that we're gonna to need to deal with a world that we don't even know will exist in the future and how adaptable and agile are we in training people in the industry? Next slide. So um, reimagining the better normal to me has a series of factors. I've only had a few minutes this evening, but these are some of the things that I think we could be looking at. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm, I'm definitely going to need some more paper because I keep, to, I keep sitting here taking more notes and trying to figure out some more questions. And I think the last thing we, we need to address, or one of the last things we need to address is risk, risk management, risk mitigation. Maybe Dr. Maybe Dr. Burt can jump in and give his presentation as well, and then we can round this out. And as soon as that's done, I do have some a bunch of questions that I'd like to give to all of you. So please be ready to answer some of those things, particularly based on the things that you've already mentioned. Dr. Burt? Well, good morning and good afternoon, or even good evening, Walter. Uh, welcome and greetings from Chiang Rai, the cool north of Thailand. As of introduction, I'm an hotelier by default. I'm a crisis expert by necessity, and I am now an academic by, by compassion. I learned a long time ago, even at the hotel school already, to believe in Murphy's Law 
and that's what we see happening all the time. This was the first time I personally in my career got hit with being made redundant because of the Arab-Israel war when I worked in Morocco in 1967. So nothing new on the world. Long story short, learning about crisis, I had the pleasure of writing two different publications. And again, it's all about what's going and what can go wrong. My compliments are to the Macau Tourism Board that started a tourism crisis management office about 10 years ago and is, as far as I know, in Asia, the only proactive organization. Reactive, but very well done, was the crisis we had in Nepal, where again, with Fata's help and the super help of the industry, we were able to bounce back very fast. Once I started working after the hotel school, I worked for a general manager in the Munich, in the Munich uh, Sheraton Hotel, who always asked us the same question, what else can go wrong? And then determine the risks and implement the strategies. And that is basically what we're still not doing because we don't keep asking ourselves what else can go wrong. We all know that we're running risks doing business that can create incidents and that can create crisis and even disasters. So again, we have to learn and it's all about leadership. This is your job, no your job, no your job, no you do it, you do it, you do it. And at the end of the day, nobody does it. And that's what happening still. Please never forget the Chinese already knew three and a half thousand years ago that every crisis can be an opportunity. And situations like we have at the moment are happening since the last 2000 years. And in 2009, we had the HN1N swine uh, epidemic. Again, what did we learn from that? Hardly anything. During this pandemic in, nine, in 1889, these were the posters that were all over Paris. Restez-vous and lavez-vous main. What else is new? But we do every time we are totally surprised and wondering. Social distances has been around for a while. And what we see happening with all the statues have been and done before either. So history repeats itself, but we don't seem to learn from it. So we have to learn to expect the unexpected. And we all in our industry have to go beyond the needed re-emerging by asking what else can go wrong. Next, new old normal, the good news is that people will always need to eat, to drink, and to sleep. So there will be business for us ever. So let's think about happy 2030. Start taking risks now more seriously. Do risk management so that 2030 can be a happy new year. This should be now on executive level responsibility, not a middle management. Safety and security is not just the security officer or the front officer's responsibility. It is the general managers and even the owner's responsibility. And we have to stop doing just what others are doing and follow each other blindly. The first strategy I recommend is risk management. Step number one, identify your risk. Step number two, analyze them. Step number three, plan to avoid and mitigate the risk. Step number four, track your risks. 
And step number five, keep controlling them. If you do those five steps, that will help you to start thinking forwards and to start coming up with the strategic thinking that Walter was just talking about. Strategy number two is do risk evaluation on a regular basis. Process very simple. Identify the risk and determine the significance of those risks. There are various systems. One I recommend is the so-called PESTEL system, political risk, environmental, social, uh, technology, economic, and legal risk that we are facing. Number three, a risk resistor. If I would be a board member of any hotel chain or any hotel organization, I would ask the owners, the management, to come up with this risk register. What can go wrong and how are we going to mitigate and what are we needed to mitigate that for? Because if we have this, we can start planning accordingly. And step number four, probably the most important, develop the what if scenarios. What if employment are going to be totally changing? What if there's going to be a 25, 26 or 27 COVID? What if the sustainable supply chains, which we have seen are very uh, difficult at the moment, are falling apart again? What if we have no more water? What if the carbon emissions are getting even more out of hand? And what if, if there's going to be a World War III, which at the moment with some of the politicians I see around, would not be a mission impossible. So, please think about this. In Australia, they saw the pre-Christmas business fires were the worst that could happen to them. Well, little did they know, a little bit later. So destinations and organizations that successfully respond to a crisis will ultimately emerge stronger. And that's where, again, Walter comes in with the DMMO, where everybody works together to look at what the customers, the employees, and the other stakeholders should be involved with and how we can avoid breaking the egg time and time again with no solution whatsoever. Bottom line, key to success, education. Crisis, what crisis? Is what I am teaching at various universities and what I'm working with various destination companies and organizations like here in Nepal. How can we mitigate the crisis and how can we do that in a better way? Education at the College of Innovation at Tamasat University, which was a brainchild of Dr. Walter. We do a, every semester, a class is organizing an evacuation plan and implementing that evacuation in a simulation exercise. These are the things that should be done everywhere. A simulation exercise, and I've seen them in hotels, is not just a fun half an hour or an hour free and, oh, are we having fun? These are serious things, and we should take them more serious. But if we don't educate the kids of today, then the managers of the future will not do it. These kids are already telling me that they have asked within their companies they are working now that this should be done too. So, to everybody, stop playing ostrich. These days are over. We have to get ready for 2030. And I believe that if we're ready well, then we can do a good job. The problem, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. There are two factors in tourism that have a problem. Common sense 
is unfortunately not so common. And as you can see on this little clip, what is the other side of the road? And quite often they think it's greener than their own road. And the biggest enemy of tourism is this one. We have to learn to reduce greed so that we can invest in sustainability, in safety and security, and in making sure that we are better prepared for the risk that we will continue to run. So it's time to stop and go down the ladder and push every problem on the lower levels. It's time to take action. These are the, gonna be the top countries by GDP in 2030. Are you preparing to start working with them? I hope you do. Because if you want to have a 2030, a happy new year, these are your customers. A few you have probably not really thought about yet. So thank you for your time. I hope that my goal to help you reach yours has been achieved with this exercise too. Dr. Bert, that was great. Really, all three of these presentations were really fantastic. And like I said, I now have a full page worth of notes. I want to start just in the, um, <clears throat> just for time reasons. I want to start with backcasting. And Perry, I thought this was a really interesting concept, right? This whole idea of defining the desirable future and what it's meant to look like. And I would run through with all of you what I think the, few, what I think the past was. I think if you looked at the 70s and kind of the original growth of air travel and travel in general, it was for wealthy people. You'd sit on an airplane in a bowler hat and eat some really good food and maybe drink some champagne and you're probably wearing a suit. And I think if you asked them what the desirable future was back then, they would say, let's have more people travel. Let's make this more mass. And I think through the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s, that's exactly what happened. And I think the development of the A380 and the 787, as you talked about and as everybody mentioned here, is kind of what drove that. Let's, if we want more people to travel, then let's get them to travel and let's make it easier for them, cheaper for them to travel and more efficient. It meant airports got more efficient and it also meant different types of hotels started getting built. So instead of these grand old hotels, you ended up with Toon, right? Um, at, at kind of the end of that cycle. But what is that desirable future? If you're backcasting now and any of the three of you can answer this, including what the risk management looks like, including what the innovation looks like, if you are backcasting, what does it look like next? Because, and we talked about this offline, it can't look what it can't look like what it looked like in January. Because if touching things are gonna go away, if mass gatherings are gonna go away, at least to a certain extent, and if we have an opportunity to build something different or have a better normal, right? What is that better normal? Do you wanna start with that, Perry, since you were the one who spent most of the time talking about what that future was gonna look like? <laughs> Well, thanks for that, and it's a really good question. Um, so just to recap, the, the idea of us backcasting, uh, in, in case anyone missed that for my first presentation with there, was, was looking at a, at a future and coming up with a desired goal. Yep. So I use the example of Toyota saying, we're gonna get rid of petrol engines by 2050. Yep. Um, while the present, uh, you know, this morning, I, I was just reading that uh, a company in China, Didi uh, Chuqing, I think if I present that correctly, they've announced they're going to have, and they've got backing from Apple, a million self-driving taxis by 2030. Now, that's going to revolutionize how we get around cities, the whole taxi industry, et cetera. So what you do with backcasting is you, you put a stake in the future and we vision, we, we vision to that. Right. So in asking your question there, how do I see 2030 for the tourism industry? Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think we need, uh, and of course, this is where Walter's point comes in. It's very complicated because we've it segmented is. tourism. We had the planning people over here and the promotion people over here. The cities didn't talk to the tourism people. Uh, my wife, for example, works uh, with an organization here in KL called Think City. And, and tourism is only one component of what they're looking at. In our world, tourism is everything. In their world, tourism is just a small bit of urban planning. So we have to remember where we sit within, within that. Now, to come down to the, the point about tourism, I think what we've realized, we need to look at our past mistakes 
And obviously, over-tourism, significant problem. Exactly. Uh, you're seeing cities like Amsterdam, that's originally from the Netherlands, and the, the Dutch are now saying, look, we can't see, if we forecast 5% every growth every year, this is going to make the Great Wall of China on a busy Sunday afternoon look like it's not that busy. We, right. can't, we don't want to live that way. We have to vision something different. And so I think this is going to create uh, an opportunity for the industry to disperse tourists out more. That's going to have implications for hospitality and tourism. Airbnb came out of left field. The tourism industry didn't see, and the hotel industry really didn't see that one coming. I can't see bits of that going away, but what I do see is much greater regulation. So my hunch is that cities and countries are going to step into more regulation with tourism, much more than you're seeing now. And so that's why I kept asking, what's our vision? Because if we don't create one, other people will create it for us, simply by regulation. The car industry would love to sell you cars that still only go five miles to the gallon, but their regulation has told them you can't do that anymore. I got it. So we have to work out what we want our vision to be. And I think we want a less crowded because tourism is part of communities. And if tourism destroys the very communities like Venice, like Amsterdam, it's part of, it's game over for us. You know, we create a, a, a Disneyland. I agree. And, and look, I, my first time in Angkor Wat was in 1998. And in a way, there's part of me that refuses to go back because I literally took a leisure walk around Taprom and around Angkor Wat itself. And there was nobody really in the way. I, I walked up the front stairs of Angkor Wat and was just amazed by the view and the majesty of it all. And I won't go back because I hear it's completely been over-touristed. And, you know, because of the <clears throat> the rise of mass tourism and the low cost of flying, at least the relatively low cost in relative terms from you know 50 or 60 years ago, that almost seems like it was purposeful. Do you think, do you, does anybody on, on the call though think that there's a virtual reality solution, particularly from a sustainable standpoint, to allow people to go to Angkor Wat, experience it in a way that's immersive? go to the top of the Eiffel Tower and do that. Walter, please, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. Well, so I'm really curious what, what, what that looks like. I'd like to go back to the, the question you asked earlier. Please. We think about what uh, Dr. Burt said and talked about greed. If we're trying to think of 2030. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, uh, that is an essential question. Um, you know, th there's those of us that talk about tourism as a force for change, for good, for increasing uh, environmental conservation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been advocating, Harold Goodwin and I, and many have been advocating for this for a long time. So it seems to me that one part of the vision has to be, why are we going to do tourism? What do we hope that it's going to accomplish? Right. Is it going to provide opportunities for women? Is it going to safeguard the rights of uh, endangered species, et cetera, et cetera? So it seems to me, and I, I really like the way that Dr. Pert ended, because to me that that question of greed it drives everything else. And and one other thought, Michael, I well, have to ministers for some time, ministers of tourism, and saying, what are the metrics that you use to measure success? And you know, we hear pleasantries, SDGs, whatever, but then the next time they're in front of their cabinets or their fellow tourism ministers, what they talk about is the increased number of tourists in their right. destinations. Yeah. And that well, has to go away, right? We need to be able to say that, as Perry was saying, what's appropriate to a destination, how does it make it a better place based on what the people of the destination want? Yeah, and absolutely. So tourism help that as opposed to the other way around. Sorry. So you bring, no, it's okay. You bring up a couple of other really good points, and let's just make this clear. The Japanese after the after the earthquake in 2011 you know saw tourism fall off a cliff and in the ensuing eight years they made a goal to have first 20 million people and then 40 million people come and visit Japan for the Olympics um, if that's not a perfect example of greed I don't know what is but the other thing is that if you think about 40 million people coming to visit a country where only 125 million people live and most of the locations where those people go are Tokyo Osaka Kyoto and, and they're known even 40 million people total in all of those places. It, it is interesting to me, and I actually put in my notes, travel is generally considered a good thing. But it's like, 
everything in moderation, nothing in excess in a way, but how do you create that balance? Because if it's okay for me to go to Venice, why isn't it okay for you to go to Venice? And how do you find that balance between the risks that Dr. Burt was talking about, the desired future that Perry was talking about, and this idea of greed as well? How do you find that balance? Well, try to explain that to the satay seller in Phuket or the deck chair yeah. seller in there. And all they want is money, money, money. The genie is out of the bottle. They have seen the possibilities of making honest money and also not so honest money and telling them now that because we're going to save the country, we have to reduce the amount of visitors. And like they're trying to do at the moment here in Thailand, say we only want quality tourism and uh, we're going to let in ten, a thousand people uh, a day only. That's not going to work. Because these people, in the meantime, over the last 20 years that this has developed, have developed a certain style of living, and they need the money. Quite often, they have wonderful children that go to school or even universities, and they need the money. Are you going to tell them, sorry, uh, we have to make sure we're going to be sustainable, and you're only going to make half the money? It's not going to work that way. And politicians will not be able to do so because if they do that, they're losing votes and then they're losing their jobs and then they're losing all the interest they can create. And right. therefore, we're in a kind of cycle which, you know, we're not going to get out unless we start sub venting or st start inventing new ways for all these people to maintain their lifestyle that they have been able to create over the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, what are these numbers from? The tourism in Thailand is what, 17, 18% of the entire economy. So for a country like Thailand, if you dial it back 50%, you're going to have a real economic gap you're going to have to fill and like you said it, but it's, it's true everywhere in the world i mean italy has a lot of tourism japan obviously we talked about it as well and don't underestimate the amount of tourism that's in the united states too governments globally are going to have to figure out if they want to restrict visitors into their countries which to me seems anathema actually but if they do how are they going to fill those gdp gaps i think that that's really interesting i do want to go back to this too do we think that there are technological solutions? I still want to stay high. I don't want to get into specifics like, you know, thumb printed door locks or please open the door for me using voice activation. I think all these things are going to happen anyway. But do we think that there is a technological solution at scale to eliminate some of these problems and also contribute to the sustainability that Perry mentioned? Well, I'll, 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 I'll jump in there. Um, to go back to your previous question, I, I know, um, but Walter went back to the previous, previous question, but I want to pick up on the virtual reality and the other use of how we can use technology in more smartly. I'll bring the two together. First of all, uh, I, I started getting interested in virtual reality um, and wrote my first article about VR in 1994, now 26 <laughs> years ago. Um, when I was living in Hong Kong in those days and I saw the conceptual view of what VR could potentially do. And in those days, it was more about gaming. Most of it was actually developed by the US military to help them drive tanks or practice driving tanks. I was uh, at that smart tourism conference in Vietnam. I had an amazing VR experience jumping off the, 80, uh, the, the top of Vin Pearl 81. Yeah, no, the reality you. that you've now got with that technology has moved on leaps and bounds and it will right. leap again. And I suspect that I may not have to go to universities to physically lecture. As I said, this year, you know, I was supposed to go to Innsbruck. I don't think I'll need to next year. Um, I'll just go into put my VR headset on and my students will do the same. We'll all be in the same virtual room. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I honestly think that will happen and that will have impacts, not just for tourism. I think we'll just be one small bit of it, but for everything that we're, we're uh, used to using where we've got constrained space. 
So I think people will be able to virtually visit destinations uh, as well as has an enhanced experience when they're there at the destination. Because certain places we can only get so many people into the pyramids of Giza, we can only have so many people in a museum. And that's part of the problem to connect it to the second bit, which is this issue of smart tourism. It's not so much the number of tourists, it's the how we're distributing the tourists to a place. And this is the bigger part of the problem because everyone goes to the same museum at 10 a.m. in the morning. Yep. And why does everybody go to one particular spot in one particular city? There's many other wonderful places in the Netherlands to visit, but no one tells anyone about them. Hmm. The tourists, and I blame personally, and I've given this in many presentations, I blame the bucket list. Ever since that movie came out, everyone's got these 10 places I have to go and see. So guess what? The population of 7.5 billion people on the planet can't go to all the same 10 places. You know, it's just not going to fit. So we need, and destinations need to be clever about how they develop tourism in their country to disperse it more so that you're not ending up with all these honey little honeypot destinations, which account in many countries for a very high percentage of the tourists who come in. Yeah. And to go back to your point about Italy, I, there was a beautiful quote the other day. It said, look, Venice is a five-star meal that we're serving up as fast food. Yeah, exactly. And this is a little bit of the problem I think we see with tourism because of the way we work. If you've only got short vacations, like Americans have, two weeks at best, or we work five days a week, you've only got a long weekend to go away. Interestingly, this change of now companies actively saying people can work from home, they can only have a three or four day working week. This may mean people will be able to travel in a different way because often work is travel is only the available time after work. You change the work dynamics, the travel dynamics will change as well. But you, so Walter, I want to just add something in, but I do want you to follow up on this for a second. Can we use the smart cities as tourists, right? As the consumers to say, you know, to look at their phone and see what is the crowd like now at the Parthenon, right? And should I go later? What time should I go? I can see now on my website the times that people visit and the times that it's freer. I, I know it seems very specific, but I'm curious, there are much better uses, as you were talking about, for smart cities, smart tourism, so that a million people who are visiting Tokyo at the same time don't try to go have sushi at Jiro, since it only seats 10 people. Walter, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about visitor management and tourism for a long time. Yep. And certainly in the national parks in the U.S. and Canada and Europe, we've been doing this. You know, we have reservation systems. We have carrying capacities. And so I completely agree with, with what um, Perry was saying. Um, uh, and so I think the way that we manage the visitor using technology, uh, developing new attractions, that we can still accommodate a lot more tourists at our um, our destinations um, more effectively without the kind of of uh, negative uh, implications we've been getting. But one of the the troubles we have is is well, as Bert was saying, a large number of people have now become part of the tourism economy. So often marginally, marginally, but they're part of the tourism economy. But, you know, if you look at the work of the World Economic Forum and a series of others and looking at the future of work, not only will it be different, as Perry was describing, but there may not be enough work for everyone. That there's a, there may be a reality that the, we may be in a situation where governments may have to change the way that we have a guaranteed annual income. Now, that's getting a bigger picture, but we have to assume that, accept the fact that there may be situations where we simply cannot, that tourism can't meet all of the employment needs in a sustainable way in a destination. And so I think that's an important factor. I, I, I agree. Look, we have a question from our virtual audience. So I wanna throw this out there for you as well. Um, somebody from Malaysia wants to know, to Dr. Burt actually, what strategy do you recommend hotels to execute in order to quickly bring back guests in this time of crisis or right after the crisis? Well, first of all, get out of your silo. Become part of the destination. Many hotels are just doing their job 
and providing the services they are supposed to provide. But if you ask them about the destination and being part of that destination, they hardly get involved. Second step is safety, health security. You will have to prove, and I know there are many hotels that are working on it, specifically the larger chains, that you have taken all the steps to make sure that in this new normal, in these circumstances that we are now much more aware of, it is safe to be in your hotel. Is it safe to check in? How is your room being cleaned? How is the food safety being handled? And all these things. Housekeeping used to be the hidden department in a hotel. Right. Now it should be the upfront department in the hotel. Right. They should become highly visible so that when I walk into a hotel, I see housekeeping doing their job, which, you know, 10 years ago was basically a crime when the housekeeping was in the lobby during check-in, check-out, or yeah, that they, created they, all kinds of problems. Out. Out. So yeah. That is what hotels should do, to, step two. And step number three is communicating, communicating, communicating with your customers about the actions being taken. Of course, different types of customers. What are you doing for the mice market? What are you doing for the wholesale market? What are you doing for the FIT market? Business travelers. And tell those people what you are doing to make sure that they're welcome and much more safe than they ever have felt before. Okay, then thank you very much for answering that question. This maybe should go back to Walter as well. Another question from the audience, from one of our listeners in Thailand. Maybe more specifically, what can or should governments do to revive tourism as opposed to some of the things we talked about where they're thinking about resist, restricting it to a certain number of people coming in every day? Yeah, I, I, you know, right now, obviously, um, over tourism looks like a good thing. You know, there are a lot of destinations that like to have too many tourists. So we have to accept the fact that probably we were talking 2030, right? But right now um, is better understanding your your potential markets. I agree. Everything Bert said, I think, are necessary conditions, safe, um, you, you know, good communication. Um, but I also think it means changing your idea of who your visitor is going to be. I'm not saying anything new here, that it's going to be local. And when you've been a five-star hotel catering to international tourists, it's going to mean a complete change of mind, <clears throat> both in terms of what you can charge and what you're going to offer and how your staff is going to work in order to be able to deal with that local market. Um, try to think about the kind of activities that would be not would be of interest to an international tourist, but not a local. What are the locals going to be looking for? What kind of uh, uh, of, of um, uh, experiences would they desire um, when they get away? Going to be very different. And going back to Bert's point, it's an essential part of disaster planning to always be thinking about that ahead of time. If we lose our international market or part of it. Uh, what can we do? And the, but but the thing that we are always going to hear, and I've heard Bert talk about this on many occasions, is not to discount, because Thailand has done this on a numerous occasions, mm -hmm. and suddenly, as if I've been paying, you know, a uh, hundred dollars a night for a hotel, and you discount it to fifty, the next time I go back to your hotel, that's a fifty dollar hotel. Now. There are more creative ways of doing it, a free room, uh, extra services, free meals, but don't discount because it's the reason that people are not going to your destination isn't because it's too expensive. There could be reasons. There's nothing to do. It's not safe. Um, there are better things to do with my free time. Um, and then the last thing, can I just mention, Michael, is partnerships. Yes. Yes. It's really to get back to 
a point that Bert uh, started off with in his latest comments and I've talked about, how do you partner? And I've we've actually talked to hotels, work with the local uh, women's group um, at the temple to uh, uh, do a meal that's gonna provide income to the community and it's gonna be absolutely novel and completely different. Work with the local um, nature group, work with the people who are doing bicycle trails. Think about the way that you can bring that community in, um, in partnership, so you're, you're helping the community, but you've been doing things that you could never do before. And so I think that partnership idea is really important. Bert's point, get out of your silo. The hotel is a place to live, but people are not going to Phuket to live in your hotel necessarily. They're going to look at things to do that are of interest to local people uh, right. and not national tourists. So something else that's actually quite interesting to me is what I call the loss of serendipity when you travel. When I first went through Asia, maybe this will ring a bell with you guys. We used to use something called the Lonely Planet. It wasn't the it wasn't the little yellow book, but it was the Lonely yeah. Planet book. And we sometimes ended up in places that we never anticipated and there was nobody else there, not because there were no other tourists in Hanoi or no other tourists in Ho Chi Minh, but because we picked a different place out of the book. I think at some level, and you know, excuse me, Priceline for having to say this, but I think TripAdvisor and Agoda and all these places have taken the serendipity out of travel, and that's kind of what you're talking about. If you work with the local people and go back to that travel experience as opposed to the travel location, that to me is part of my desirable future. And, and there are things for sustainability around this as well. If you're going to reduce potentially the number of travelers to your country, but you redirect them to places that never joined that part of the economy, that to me seems to be what part of the 2030 vision of what travel should look like, particularly in places like Southeast Asia. But wouldn't you want to go into somebody's home in Tuscany and eat a home cooked meal as opposed to going to the same restaurant that everybody else goes to? I think it's a great idea, actually. And I love the experience, it's really cool. Can I just- Well, I think, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Walter, please. Uh, just to, to add to this, I'm, I, uh, I'm on the advisory board of a company called G Adventures, or, and they're all over the world. And they do exactly what you're just saying, Michael, is that they work with local groups, to, it's a, whether it's a meal or something else. And you have to go with G Adventures in order to get that. You, I can't show up in a village in Nepal. No, no, no. They're going to bring me into there. So they actually uh, do this. And it's, and it's done in such a way that it helped that group to form, usually women, uh, so the spread of the wealth in the community builds capacity um, and it provides. And so to work with the G Adventures to say, can you, what are you doing? Where are you bringing your guests? Um, might be one way of tailoring that to your local audience or maybe even internationally that this group that you were talking about with their lonely planet have always been the ones that have led the, the, the way, right? They're the ones yeah. and they're not going to be worried about, you know, clean, you know, washing their hands every five minutes. Um, they're going to be out, and we can see this already, that young people. But I think those G Adventures and those kind of people are the ones that can really tell us what works and how do they put it together. Yeah. Harry, go ahead. We interrupted you. Well, I, I, I think technology will, will play uh, an interesting leapfrog here because we've gone from the Lonely Planet, which was, uh, which was great for, for, for many people, but unfortunately, it did also kettle a lot of people to particular places when people wrote up about it. And uh, then the other, you know, trip advisors, all the rest of it. I think now with technology, being able to see what sort of places interest you. So if you can say, you know, I'm interested in old bookshops, small coffee shops, whatever it is. And then, you know, you will be able to get a personalized itinerary or get to go to other places. So this will bring, no doubt, all sorts of confusion when you travel as a family and four people's smartphones are telling them to go in four different directions. But I think where my point is with this is that it will personalize it to the sorts of things you're interested in and have seen to be interested in. And I think then we can help those smaller businesses and those out of the way places be seen because at the moment, largely, they're invisible. The big places dominate the downtown areas, your Starbucks on one corner, your McDonald's on another corner. To be honest, it could be the same, same. You know, it, it's very hard to get out of that. Now, unfortunately, some people seem to be quite happy with that. 
why they travel kind of often befuddles me. But anyway, for, if for people who wish to see and get beyond that, well, again, I come back to the bucket list. I think most of it is telling people they went somewhere, but they didn't actually have to do anything different. Now, if that's your goal, then you, you've ticked the box. But I think for other people, this will be an, another opportunity where we can guide people. Uh, but again, with all forms of technology, it can be manipulated, hacked, and all the rest of it. And that's what we've also got to be wary of. Right. And I, I bring this up because I go back and look at my own travel experiences. And I literally have to go back to 1991, I'm guessing, or 1992 at the, at the least, and say the best experience I ever had was sitting in, actually standing in the main, in the main square in Lhasa in Tibet. And some guy walked down three flights of stairs and said in English, hey, why don't you guys come upstairs to my house and we'll have some cha. It turns out that guy um, graduated from Williams College in 1957 and wrote the only Chinese Tibetan English dictionary. But he took us literally into the back room of his house, just as you suggested. And that was still is like burned into my memory. I can still see that guy. I can still see the pool table at the bottom of those stairs. And that's why I traveled. And I agree with you. If you just want to sit underneath the Eiffel Tower and have some French fries from McDonald's, what's the point, right? But if you really want to experience a place, you should figure out a way to do that better. And hopefully that, you know, I think things go cyclical, right? In the same way that there were mom and pop stores, then there were department stores, and then there were boutiques. I think travel, hopefully, in my mind, that desired future for me is, is the same thing. Mass travel is the department store, but now you want to get back to the point where you can now use technology. I was going to ask you this about personalization to personalize that experience. I don't want to go to the Coliseum. I want to go to the place four blocks away that no one's ever been to and have the best pizza and the best red wine I've ever had in my life. And only personalization and technology can help do that, I think. Which is another point we haven't talked about at all, food and beverage 2030. Um, Club Sandwich in the 24-hour coffee shop is still the average. And if hotels don't start moving their food and beverage operations and start thinking like you were talking, local, international, and away from these horrible, uh, even buffets, let right. alone the corona effect of that, yeah. of that buffet, then again, the hotel industry will have to do a lot of rethinking on the food and beverage part. And I see hotels with five restaurants not surviving from a financial point of view, from a food and beverage point of view, very much longer. So another food for thought for Hospitality 2030. Where are you going with your food and beverage? Yeah, because Dr. Burke, doesn't this bring up this whole concept of greed that you were talking about? You know, seasoned travelers know that they can eat, you know, they can eat in the coffee shop for five dollars or they can literally go right around the corner and get a cup of coffee for 35 cents and the quality outside is probably going to be better and again it gets back to that experience we were talking about we know and i think it angers tourists consumers and travelers when they sit in the coffee shop and think really six and a half dollars for a cup of coffee that's why they're empty so you do have to rethink it and if i can tie it together with something that walter said it would be awesome if those hotels, even if they're five-star hotels, feature and they can change it every month or every week, some local chef or some local person who's trying to build a restaurant that can then extend out into the main part of the city or the town. That would be awesome for economic development and may, and may eliminate some of the problems we talked about before creatively for any GDP fall off for potentially fewer travelers. But these are the kinds of innovative ideas that I'd like to keep talking about. I mean, I would love to ask all three of you what you actually think a hotel is gonna look like if you could build it from scratch and you could create its experience from scratch in, in 10 years. If you could just sit there and ideate for the next 10 years, what would that hotel look like? I have my own ideas, but you're the experts. And, and not just, and maybe this is just too deep in the weeds for this conversation, but I'm really curious what that whole experience looks like. Because even getting from an unknown airport, I remember my first time at Dom Wong and trying to get to the hotel and I just thought, I'm never gonna make it there, never, right? But it's not, the reality is it's actually not that scary, it's not unsafe, it's perfectly fine. But how do you change that as well? Now that gets back to partnerships with the government and the private sector and actually the individual hotels 
and maybe he brings up your point of siloing again. But I'm really curious what, and you don't have to answer it. I think we've been at this long enough for today's conversation, but that's the thing that sticks in my head is, what does the hotel of the future look like? And if anybody wants to answer, please go ahead. But if not, I'll just thank everybody for, for going. Walter, Can go I, ahead, please. I, want to thought. I, I agree that maybe this is not the, the time to do I'm it. Curious, though. But if I'm sitting here listening to, to this conversation, I could say, this: you're just a bunch of elitists. You know, I mean, you know, there are people uh, in my own extended family who, when they travel, mm -hmm. want to have safety. They want to know when they go to the hotel. I don't mean safety as Bert. They want to know what the room's going to look like. They want to have. They want to know that the food is is safe and clean. Um, they like taking cruises because that's a something they know about, and it's all controlled. Yeah. So I think we just yeah. have to be careful that that we're talking about a multiplicity of markets, and that yeah. we'll have to recognize even in twenty thirty, especially older people. Now you're all young people, um, but old people like Bert and I know that your needs change and so you know having uh, a room of a certain quality with grab bars in the bathrooms and accessible and all that so i think we have to accept the fact that there's this wide range and some people Absolutely. definitely want to do what you're talking about Absolutely. but also we we can't turn around to people and say if you want the safe holiday but you still want to experience our country and see the culture but in a different way we don't want you but, you know and and as a hotelier, I would never want to say that, that one thing you want to be able to do is to ensure that that some of the hotels in your destination are clearly, you know, oriented to people who have very specific needs. You know, Bert and I both have physical challenges. So our needs are different than, you know, somebody like Perry who's like 29 years old. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I think it's just a matter of I had hair back then. Yeah. <laughs> Harry, Harry was planking for the five minutes before we started this conversation. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. And I was trying to, the reason why we didn't bring that up was because I didn't want to get so far into the weeds and I want to keep it more general. But I do agree with you that it may seem like this is a very elitist conversation. I was trying to keep it more strategic and general, but you're right. Um, you know, most people of a certain age, the, the worst possible thing that could happen to them is they fall and slip in a shower. They'll break their hip and they may never recover from it. And there are other sort of fiscal restrictions that people have, but also food restrictions. All these things are very important. Look, you brought up UBI. We could spend an hour talking about that alone and how it impacts the way local economies develop. And is it really necessary? And should governments be spending less money on you know, five-star hotels and more money on plowing that back into universal basic income for people. I, I agree completely. We're, I'm being I'm being asked to ask another question from the audience. We think we covered this a little bit, so it's slightly redundant, but just to benefit the people that are listening. What other strategies should hotels do or are required to encourage that local tourism, right? I mean, some people call it a staycation, but it's more just like for me to travel from here to Chiang Mai as opposed to for me to travel from here to Vietnam or back to Los Angeles. Well, okay. I mean, I think, you know, here in Malaysia, um, we're seeing uh, obviously our borders are still closed and it looked like they're going to open to the end of the year. I was just um, chatting with a hotelier the other day who owns a property up in Langkawi Island, 80% international tourists is his normal mix, 20% local. So, you know, like a lot of tourists, <coughs> uh, hotels, he he's, doesn't have the supply chain that, that comes in and obviously, like many other hotels, he's having to work out how to reorientate his product uh, to the local market. And that's, for a lot of hoteliers is, is, who've been fairly clearly, as, as Walter was saying, if you're focused on a particular market segment, how do you change and what else do you need to do? And I think for a lot of hotels in the short term, the challenge is that short term may be much longer term than everyone's expecting. If you yeah, look exactly. at the outbreaks in, Beijing this last week in Germany, uh, in, in Melbourne and Australia, um, it's now looking less likely that some of these travel um, uh, uh, barriers will come down, you know, very quickly potentially in some markets. So I think uh, as has been indicated today, it's a question of how to understand those local markets and that's everything from food to the experience to the product and how you're gonna have to reorientate yourself reasonably quickly to provide that 
and even price points and everything else is, is quite different from, say, an international market. Right. So these are not easy changes to make. I think going forward, the question is to learn how do you keep a balance? Because as Bert has been putting out, um, if you want to talk about a new normal, it's been how resilient is your business? So, you know, organizations who are heavily depend on one market need to sort of take heed of that for their future planning. Yeah, and look, again, I went back and I gave you my sample, my very simple sample ideas about what travel was like in the 70s, what it was like kind of in the 80s and 90s, and what it turned out to be in the 2000s and up until now. And the one thing we didn't talk about was sort of the global demographic changes. And maybe it's not the global demographic changes, but the global economic changes. I'm going to go back even further and generalize, right? But in the old days, <clears throat> Europeans traveled a lot more than Americans because they were much wealthier. And they would travel around Europe in a way that was extremely civilized, and it was wonderful, right? And, and because of the way summer vacations and vacations are scheduled in Europe, it was well understood when that time and when that where those places were going to be. But as the U.S. came out of World War II and started becoming wealthier, they started traveling as well. And that was really into the 70s, and then the Japanese started getting wealthy in the 80s. And now you have the two largest countries in the world, the India and China becoming wealthy too. And now the whole world is just filled with people that don't want to be in their hometown and want to go somewhere else. And I think we need to continually think about, like you said, seven and a half billion people cannot be on an elevator in the Eiffel Tower. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> right. And I think that's also, and it brings up the risks and the partnerships and everything that we've discussed today. But I wanted to point that out too, because I think that's part of the difference today is that there are just so many more people, not just on the employed side of the travel industry, but just so many more people can afford to travel. Sure. Yeah. yeah but, well, know, we, we've created that. Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. The challenge of domestic tourism, when we look, for instance, at Thailand, is this old mantra of location, location, location. <laughs> Where are the domestic tourists coming from? Right. Bangkok. <clears throat> Where can they travel? Hua Hin, Pattaya, by car. Chiang Mai. By car for a weekend? Sure. Not really possible. I know some people are doing that, but, you know, very few are doing that. And most of that is family related, not tourism related. Right. So they're going to visit the family for all kinds of reasons. So the poor people in Phuket that are being told at the moment you should get domestic market, they're sitting with their hands in their hair because even now that the airport is open again, they only going to bring 10,000 people a day. And how many hotel beds we have in Phuket. So well, again, yeah. we're using domestic as a plaster on a wound that is much bigger. And that plaster won't be able to solve this problem. What they need and what thailand needs very clearly is international tourism now i don't want to get into politics i understand the reasons some people believe that shouldn't be done other people believe that should be done it's a matter of in my eyes better lobbying than is being done at the moment but domestic tourism is not the answer to solve the problems and I don't see my housekeeper going on a holiday in Phuket. And staying so, at the Alman Puri. Forget it. Yeah. Walter, you were saying? Yeah, I, I just think that uh, I completely agree with what Bert is saying. There are some destinations that just simply won't be able to recover no. uh, from the local tourists. I mean, that's just, and for all the reasons that Bert is accurately pointed out but one of the promising areas and this has to do with the hotel so much but it's back to this bigger picture of this idea of the bubble now i'm i don't claim to be an expert on this but i was on a webinar last week uh, in indonesia and this idea of identifying destinations might not be a whole country but destinations that have the right kind of of uh, testing and vaccinations and whatever they happen to be so that we might be able to expand, you know, a, a destination be able to, may be able to expand its uh, customer base 
within that bubble where that those are international travelers, but close in. And so, you know, one of the things with, uh, with uh, Southeast Asia is that there's already strong uh, agreements amongst the various countries and they tend to work together relatively um, effectively. So it might be, as Bert says, lobbying your government to say, we, we're not gonna fill our hotels and create you know, jobs for our local people until you can work out deals where people from a certain place could come and, caref and, and safely help us with our industry. So I think Bert was absolutely right that this local thing is only gonna go so far. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna make a point about um, the same thing you guys were just talking about. GDP per capita in the United States is about $63,000 in Malaysia, which besides Singapore is the wealthiest GDP per capita country, company, excuse me, in Southeast Asia is $11,500. And even the, the likelihood that those people are gonna come into Thailand and stay at the Anon Puri where there are five workers for every guest and pay $1,500 a night is, a, is just a joke. <clears throat> and the joke is actually on the Anon Puri to be fair. But the, all of those types of resorts were built into the thing that, that Bert was talking about, and that's a little bit of greed. And I think the height of that greed was the A380 saying, let's take as many people as humanly possible, put them on the biggest possible plane and get them to the get them to their destination. But but there is there is no way in my mind that locals, like like Bert was saying, can replace international travelers because the whole idea of the things that were built and the things that were put in place was built around people coming from outside the country into your country to stay at those places that the locals can't afford. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Did we cover enough today for everybody else? I feel like we went through a whole bunch of different things, but I do feel like this as well. I feel like we left a lot of issues on the table and I would love to, just me personally, would love to get everybody back again just to keep chatting. I, I would like to, for me, I'm sure that the, the, um, the host is going to thank everybody too, but I would just like to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to doing this. I'd like to thank Convex Hub for <clears throat> inviting me to moderate Dr. Bert, Dr. Bert Van Walbeek, um, Perry Hob Dr. Perry Hobson, and Dr. Walter Jameson for having this conversation with me. I thought it was fabulous. And if anybody else is interested in the things that I do, you can look up the asiatechpodcast.com, asiainsuretechpodcast.com. I do something with True in Thailand called the Thailand Game Changer. I do something also called the Ignite Podcast. Yeah, I am a little bit busy. And something called Globe Change where I talk to students. So thank you all very much again for letting me do this. And I think we left some stuff on the table, and I'd love to do more. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thanks very much. Pleasure to have with us today, Michael, Professor Walter, Professor Perry, and Dr. Bird. And to all our viewers out there, thank you for watching Expert Insight at Live. If you like what you have seen, subscribe to Cover Top channel. Do follow us on our LinkedIn page, FB page, and Twitter for more interesting episodes and topics on market, policy, strategy, technology, and innovation in your economic sector that have steered the industry growth. Coming up next, how blockchain can solve supply chain meltdowns exposed by coronavirus pandemic June 25th, 2020 at 11 a.m.